Hi everyone, my name is Rhiannon Payne, Marketing Director at Ruby Central, and today I'm here with Casper Tim Hansen, who is a previous Rails Core member and is now an independent Rails consultant. Casper, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Hey, Rhiannon, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's talk to We're you today. We're very excited to have you join us at RailsConf this summer in Philly. Really looking forward to your talk. I'd love to jump right in and just hear a little bit about what inspired it. Yeah, for sure. So basically what inspired me to give this talk is I feel like what I've seen is I have a slightly different take on both learning and how to progress as well. So I've what I'm trying to do is try to put all of that into this talk. And I'm still trying to figure out how much to go into it or whatever and finding all that levels for that. Basically, my talk is informed by having dove into Rails so much from being on a core team and previously from that, just working on Rails and learning a ton from that and diving into a ton of other open source stuff as well. And just like seeing what's going on in there, learning a bunch of tricks from that and learning about Ruby, how things are put together, sometimes good, sometimes maybe less ideal, just out of legacy reasons and whatnot. And I think a lot of people can learn a lot from that. So this is part of what the talk is, but I'm using that as a springboard to talk a little bit more generally about learning and how I tend to learn things and how I tend to try to know things. Like I tend to use a console a lot, for instance, to try to get a real feeling for how something actually works and inject a ton of input into it and see how it responds to a certain method or whatever, innumerable select for instance, like that. Probably everybody knows how that works, but still you learn data structures that way. So that's part of it. Part of what I'm hoping people take away from this talk is essentially to have more confidence is to try things and to basically get a little bit into some of the real stuff and we'll get some examples of that. Obviously, I can't reveal the whole thing in like 30 minutes, but give people enough confidence just to try to open something up and see what's going on in there. Because once you do that with Rails, almost no other Ruby gem is scary, except for something like, I don't know, Event Machine, which isn't that popular anymore. That's at least my go-to sometimes. I've never looked at it, but I just like Event Reactors and everything. Who knows? That's probably difficult. And the other thing I'm hoping that people take away from this is essentially to see if we can give people some, hopefully some concrete tools to level up their information throughput. Because basically what I'm seeing is I've done a few sessions where I'm going through the rail source with people where what seems to be happening for me is I can lock in pretty quickly and see something about a certain piece of code and then parse it and know what's both the stuff I'm used to and the stuff I'm not used to and filter that and make judgment calls on the code fairly quickly. Weirdly enough, within like, I had an example, this is one of the things I'm going to put into the talk is looking at a game we hadn't seen before, trying to read through it and then seeing this class, it was like 22 lines, but basically within, I was as I was talking about it, and showing it and talking about it within five to seven seconds. I think we could just replace all this with a data object, one of Ruby's new features. So it's that kind of stuff I'm hoping to put into the talk so people also can learn how to do some of these things. Because I think that would be really interesting once people can just parse things and have more like higher level conversations about code a lot faster than sometimes what I'm seeing. So I think that's going to be really interesting, at least. I feel like this is one of those talks where it does seem very high level, but with very tangible takeaways. And it's something that for any Rails developer, it will have a real tangible impact on their career, how they look at code, how they work with Rails. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping at least, that it's gonna have that real sense of impact on your day-to-day -day, and people will have to put in some work to get some of the things I'm talking about, but it hopefully is really tangible, that's what I'm hoping for. We'll see. The audience will be the final judge of whether or not I've achieved that. I would love to talk a little bit more about your career. You've spent a large portion of your career working as a Rails core team member. You're now a consultant. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that journey. How did you get introduced to Rails and how did you end up joining Rails core? Yeah, sure. So I think weirdly enough, I had a kind of like a strange experience where Back in 2009 or something, I took a computer science course. We ended up using Optic Pascal. Actually, we started with assembly and it was made no sense to me back then or whatever. And then we went to Optic Pascal and doing like Windows 98 apps. But I had a Mac and it was 2008. And so we were, I had this thing called code. We were start translate things with wine and whatever and window simulation and it all worked. And so it's really weird to sit in 2009 or something and make Windows 98 apps on a Mac and it just worked. And so from there, I was just curious, what if I can program my laptop? And so I bought books on that, like Mac programming and iOS programming later on, iPhone programming. And then there was like an iPhone, the missing app manual or something like that, wherein they would talk about, if you're new to programming, maybe you're interested in some of these scripting languages. And in there, they mentioned Ruby and also Python. And they mentioned why it's important guide. So I ended up picking that up. I was like, what the hell is this? But it was really good in the sense that it was so weird and whimsical. So I just couldn't stay away from that. So I started learning Ruby that way. This is like 2010 or something. And then weirdly enough, 
I had no idea what Rails was. I didn't learn that until a year later when a friend of mine in, in high school found it for like a project we were doing, also use some tech or whatever. And we found Rails for Zombies and that's how I started learning. Code School's old thing, they're not around anymore, unfortunately, but uh, that was how I started learning. I just putting things together that way. And from then on, it was just reading documentation, trying some things out. And in, in 2013, I happened on a Rails blog one day and they were just looking for Google Summer Code students. And so I just worked for two weeks. I just happened to see it. So there's like two weeks to the deadline. So I worked on it for two weeks and I proposed to submitted that. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to pick that. But then they ended up doing that. So I ended up working on what became like the Rails HTML sanitizer and Rails DOM testing, which then used Lufa under the hood, which then used Nokogiri under the hood, because Rails was using like a regex based HTML parser internal, which you're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> so <laughs> because that's uh, like insecure and whatnot. So that was the first project and then worked on that during the summer as well. And it took a year to ship actually, but we got it shipped. And from then on, I started contributing to Global ID, shipping features for that and became a maintainer there as well. And then like in January, 2015, I remember starting just reviewing issues, reviewing pull requests on Rails and then got like the commit bit like four or five months later. And then like in, I think it was June, 2016, I made the core team as well, just continually doing that. Tons of pull request reviews, submitting the occasional PR myself as well. And then from in on more the same stuff, <laughs> shipping more features, things like that. That's incredible. So it sounds like you were very self-motivated, self-taught. You really yeah. dug into the docs, dug in and did your homework, your research and created that path for yourself in a way to enable you to work on some of the most impactful open source work, the most important open source work within the entire Rails ecosystem, which is really just such a cool story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's been strange in that sense, because I could, that's where I could tell my path is a little bit different, but I thought we were supposed to be able to do all this kind of stuff. So I think I just figured out how to do it. Like I'm really good at inferring things based on what I'm seeing and then incorporating that as well. So that's part of it in a way. Oh, this is another thing. When I first got that Google Summer Code thing accepted as well, my first thought was just like, I'll just read Rails. I don't know where that thought came from, but it was just like in prep for doing that product. I was just thinking, I'll just start reading the source code. And again, I was like a junior at that time. I don't know who else would think that way in a way, not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but it's just, it's weird when I look back on it, but I thought we were just supposed to be able to do this kind of stuff. So I just started doing, it. I still learned a ton from just peeking at things. And so that's part of what I'm hoping to put into the talk as well as like really just click things. Like it is part of it. It's just, once you get over the fear of blasting yourself with a new source file, the whole game changes essentially because it's, oh, this is just a complex source file. This is the complex source file. I don't know all what's going on here, but this little bit I know, cool. And then you can start with that kernel and spin it out. Or maybe we can grab this thing and try to put it in a console, see if you could get it work there. Or, oh, this seems to work on an array. Okay, how do I give it an array then to then call the method on it? Yeah, and you can piece things together that way. So that's part of it too. Hoping to put it into the talk. We'll see. But there's so much, and I feel like you have so much experience as well to try and figure out how to condense that into I know. what 30 minutes is really challenging. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but also fun. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's why I really love your point about being willing to just peek around, like poke around, read documentation. I feel like to be a really great engineer, you have to be curious. You have to be willing to just dive in and read everything you can and start really getting your hands dirty a little bit and playing around. And it sounds like that's been the foundation of everything you've done. Yeah. I don't know what you want to call it, like just ignorance, whatever, foolhardiness, whatever, or courage or whatever, but just it's much better just to look. Sometimes I've seen other developers who are making guesses about how things work. You can certainly do that, but honestly, it's not too bad to just try to see if you can find it internally because it's not, sometimes it is just for legacy reasons or whatever, where it's a little bit more difficult, but you can usually find bits and pieces where then you can put it together and then you can also read the docs as well to help as another lens on figuring things out. Yeah. yeah. And then the layer on top of that would be actually starting to contribute to open source projects as well. And I know we have a lot of folks in the community who haven't contributed to open source yet, but are really curious about it and just don't know where to start. Is there any advice that you would give to a developer who just hasn't made any open source contributions at all, but wants to get started, feels overwhelmed? Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing a talk, I can't remember if it was Ruby, uh, a few years ago by Razor Right Mun, who also does Twitch streaming as well, so you might check it out as well. But she had this idea of a good first repo. 
because a lot of times when people try to contribute is they run through a bunch of setup things and then it got really drained from trying to figure out how to set things up. But she had this idea of just, well, if you just commit to one repo that you want to like stick with as well, I thought it was a really interesting idea to focus on one thing. The other thing that I would say is I tend to take a little bit more of a long-term view on these things because I think sometimes when people show up, they're really eager. They're like, they think that it's about contributing code, but it's not really. It's about the right code at the right time. And so what a lot of people miss is that they'll go in and just think, I just need to ship more code. Really, I'd appreciate it more if you'd figured out how to internalize. <laughs> because what happened was sometimes people would show up and they'd submit five pull requests, you review one, maybe merge it, and then you're like, hey, I have this other one. And it's like, okay, I just need a break. <laughs> or I really wish that you had sent one each week or whatever to try to internalize what went right or what you can prove there as well. And then my other thing is just read more of the code, essentially. Read more than you think you need to. It's about building all that context to figure out where it fits in and also just being able to explore multiple ideas. That was the thing I saw a lot where people were not, which is fair. There's a difference between building applications and building libraries where at least in my experience, you want to be more capable of weighing different trade-offs where it's like, I have to maintain it for a long time. And if it doesn't quite work, I have to ship deprecation warnings. And then that's a whole thing. So it's just a slightly different mental model, which you learn over time. And then I think another thing I also suggested to do was how I started was just going to hub.com slash rails slash rails, and then click watch and just drain the file hose of everything that happens on there. I think you can filter a little bit by now where for different things or what are only comments or something like that, but you'll see who's on there, how to write and what gets merged. You want us to read merge pull request. That's also a great way to see it. Oh, they happen to get that accepted. This is a great way to learn about any open source repository, essentially. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. And I think sometimes it's also the issue where maintainers are usually quite a near burnout. <laughs> and so someone else showing up like, hey, I want to help. Then it's okay, but I don't know what skill level that person is at or what they are capable of. Sometimes it's also in the pull request and in the pull request description demonstrating that you can do things and you know how to do some things yourself as well. And that you're basically the person who can carry this through because otherwise it's just, I don't really want to deal with that. It's kind of unfortunate, but that's part of it right now, unfortunately. Absolutely. Open source is a very challenging and almost thankless in a way thing to do at the end of the day. The community really relies on this amazing open source work, but it is really hard as a maintainer to continue to manage the project, manage the pull requests, et cetera. So I think being mindful of that's important. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of work are you doing these days? You're no longer with Rails Core. How did that set the foundation for the rest of your career now? And what kind of projects have you been working on? It's been a little bit all over the place. I'm still figuring out what I want to do. I'm still doing consulting and figuring out where I fit in and what I want to explore more of. I've built MVPs and stuff like that. And that's been going really well as well. Oh yeah, I'm really good at this stuff. <laughs> it's nice to remember that. And then exploring alternatives as well. Just today, I was looking at something for a client where I've been working for a little bit where they had asked me some tough modeling questions where they're laying out, like, I have this whole thing. How do we figure it out? We build it in some ways. And there's all this like complex custom SQL queries in here. And it's difficult to figure out what's going on. And so they sent me just a write out of what they were expecting the system to be able to do. And in this past few weeks, I've just been nibbling on it and I just presented it to them today. I also built a technique for this kind of stuff. This is called riffing. I did a RailsConf talk about it last year. And this talk we're talking about now is like a spiritual successor to that as well. But basically riffed it out, figuring out what the modeling should be and presented it to them today and an hour's call. And we're like, oh, yeah, this works perfectly. <laughs> That's what we need. And then the other thing I've been looking at as well is uh, this is where this talk comes out of, just walking more people through the rail source as well. I've been doing events on this platform called Luma, like about once a month or whatever. I don't want it to like a general rail source overview. And then an action deep dive. I want to do ones for Active Record pretty soon. It'll probably be a two-part just because there's a ton of stuff in there. I've got the videos for that as well I want to put out somewhere, but that's what I've been figuring out just because I feel like there's so much you can get out of source diving and with a helping guide, it's not too bad if you're too afraid of going in there yourself. Ugh. So it sounds like your work is very much almost, maybe not split, but divided between client work, building MVPs, digging into different projects and also education, starting to work on events, the talks like you're giving at RailsConf, et cetera, and creating content around that. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I'm figuring out to see if I can still manage this kind of split. I have more stuff I want to do about this whole riffing thing and see if I can put some more videos to get about how it works. I just did a workshop about it. Helvetic Ruby was went really well. People seem to like it. When we did the examples I brought, they were tough to get them to stop. <laughs> so it seems like getting it, but it gets really cerebral really quick, which is ironic. People can see the RailsConf talk as well. I'm also a fan of doing live demos and talks. Last year was my first talk and I was just being a little bit ambitious as well, because I like the idea of doing live demos in the sense that you can't hide in that, as opposed to 
doing the whole editing or whatever, putting together pretty slides. And I was like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like I'm outing myself and then we'll see what happens. This is very honest. And I had no idea that when I got on stage that I could not add two and two together. So it became really difficult. So you can see that if you want to. <laughs> Me trying to put together, because we're essentially trying to figure out, we have a prompt for a thing we're working on. So I'm trying to figure it out as we go. People seem to like it. So that's nice. Some people found it inspiring. So I'll take that. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I'll take yeah, that. it really is like incredible sometimes when you present something to an audience and maybe you don't really know how you feel about it yourself or you have a very high bar for yourself. And then to see folks really appreciate it, get value from it, learn from it is very gratifying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was really caught off guard later on with the speaker's reception. I was standing at the bar trying to order something and someone else just leaned in and they said, hey, your talk was expiring. Oh, hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. one of those great conference moments. And I know you've been to quite a few Rails comps and Ruby comps over the years. You mentioned that last year was the first time you actually spoke at a Rails comp. I'm curious, do you have any favorite Rails comp memories from over the years? Anything that comes uh, to mind? Yeah, I think it was since it would be the talk last year, just because it was like a huge breakthrough because that weirdly enough for the longest time, I've like, I don't know what to talk about. I had the same thing that everybody else talks about. I don't know what I contributed. And I wanted to be like more original or whatever. So that was what the riffing idea was last year. It was more my own kind of thing. And now it's just like that thing has been popped or whatever. <laughs> and now it's more about what if I can take this idea and figure out how to live it down so it'll hopefully fit. I'm still maybe slightly too ambitious in talks. We'll see how it goes this year. I'm still curious to see how it's going to go. I think it's going to go well. But I try to just putting a lot of stuff in there and then hopefully people will take their takeaways. I have my intention on what I want to do with it. More confidence to explore things and also just upgrading people's information throughput as well as what I like to call it when you're just like engaging critical code as opposed to just quote unquote passively reading it. So we'll see. But yeah, that's awesome. Uh, We're really excited for your talk, really excited to see you in Philadelphia this summer. Just looking forward to hanging out with all our Ruby friends. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool, Casper. <laughs> we'll see you cool. there. <laughs> see ya. <laughs>